Uh, so Johan wrote a new book. Uh, it's called Open, The Story of Human Progress. And um, one of the nice things about this book is this, it doesn't deal with controversial issues at all. Uh, it's just a smooth, easy read. Um, no, I mean, the, the, the wonderful thing about the book is how timely it is. And, and I'm curious, did you start writing this book kind of uh, seeing the dark clouds of, of, uh, of closure appearing, uh, appearing or, or, or was this a book that you were planning to write um, irrespective of that? Well, I always have a couple of book ideas on my mind constantly. And then I try to write about what's most important at that time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I think I consider myself somewhat of a um, sort of a firefighter against the forces of closed and closed mindedness of authoritarianism of mysticism and wherever they go and start a fire and try to tear down uh, civilization i want to be there and try to put up a defense in a way or a, or, or a, an, a case for the other side so yes i i did look at this change uh, appearing in many places. We've had a backlash against open trade uh, for a long time and migration and also open societies generally. The whole idea that innovation uh, comes from surprises in various places. That's something that neither right or left is very happy with because they want to know <laughs> and, and they want to decide what happens. And they want next. to control and they want to control both right and left. Yes, I mean, uh, it, the. The backlash against innovation is quite fascinating, uh, given the progress we've made, given given the clear evidence of how innovation has, has changed the world. I mean, I know we're both, I, I interviewed Matt Ridley recently, and I know you're quite uh, friendly with Matt, and, and he's obviously done a lot of work on innovation. Um, I, can you summarize, I mean, I know you can't go into detail, can you summarize quickly kind of your previous book, Progress? Because I think it's important to set the frame of where we are at least pre-COVID, where we were, um, yeah, and and I think that sets the context for why this backlash against what made this progress possible so horrifying. Yeah, yeah, that's a good place to start because progress is really, in a way, it's a book about gratitude and why we should be grateful for the gifts of civilization of uh, the great innovators, the thinkers, the entrepreneurs who've given us so much, because it basically starts with the idea that, look, everything that has happened that really improved our lives, our lifespans, our health, wealth, opportunities, and so on, they happen in the blink of an eye, if we think of uh, the whole of Homo sapiens existence. It happened in the last 200 years, and uh, and, and most specifically in the last 25 years, if we are going global, over the last 25 years, we reduced extreme poverty by three quarters around the world, more than has ever happened before, reduced child mortality, illiteracy, and chronic undernourishment by around half in just 25 years. It is astonishing, the accomplishment. You'd think we'd be celebrating that in the streets. I mean, that's reason for <laughs> dancing in the streets, and yet... Nobody yeah. knows this. No. And had this been a political program, had someone said that, yeah, elect me, and then I'll reduce poverty by three quarters in 25 years, <laughs> they would be singing his name and dancing in the street and wrecking statues everywhere. But now this happened through this kind of seemingly chaotic uh, development of lots of people developing... And, and exploring new knowledge, experimenting with new technologies and business models and exchanging the results. And so it's, they don't have time to erect statues or, or dance in the street because they are making progress all the time. So I, I, I'm the one dancing in the streets and yep. sort of <laughs> trying to give them their due. <laughs> no, the book was wonderful. I highly recommend it. If you haven't read Progress, you should. Um, it, it, it's... Uh, it describes what has happened and, uh, and and provides the reasons for it. I mean, it is it is a consequence of freedom. It, freedom, even a little bit, it turns out, even a little bit of freedom, as we see in parts of Asia, where they haven't opened up completely, where they haven't embraced the kind of freedom that we, we believe in and we think that is essential for human survival. Just some civilizations, some 
freedom of entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship produced this amazing, amazing progress uh, in parts of the world that, that it, it, partially we don't even read about. I mean, even Africa, things have gotten significantly better in parts of Africa. Yeah. So, so it's so yeah. it's very counterintuitive, and people still don't believe me. So that's why I nag. <laughs> no, I I, I use that because often in my talks I'll ask people how how many people do you think are in extreme poverty today, and they'll say fifty percent. Once in a while, somebody had read your book or or a Rational Optimist or something, and 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 get closer to the number. And I I then I ask them, well, do you think it's been improving in the last twenty five years or, or worse? And almost always think it's worse, and they think half the population of the world is in extreme poverty. They have no concept of what has happened in recent history. And the other question I like to ask is, how many people do you think lived in extreme poverty 250 years ago in the West, in Europe, and in the United States? And that's over 90%, and they and they don't they don't really refer to that. So, to a large extent, Open is a book that tries to explain the progress. Uh, it tries to explain what happened over the last 250 years, or really throughout human history, why we've seen steady yeah. progress most of the time, not always, and then why we've seen exponential progress over the last uh, 250, 250 years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And now, uh, uh, when I try to explain what this book is about, I'm trying to say that it's like the Star Wars prequels and sequels, <laughs> but better. Uh, so if progress was had to be the, better, uh, yeah. <laughs> so if progress was the original trilogy explaining yeah. what happens here and now in our world or in a galaxy far, far away, then open is the the prequel trying to explain. So what did it take? Which kinds of institutions, the openness, the individual liberty and the free markets did it take to create this kind of progress in in various civilizations, but also a sequel uh, to the extent that I'm trying to look at, so what happens next here and now? Because all these golden ages that we had, when people started to get close to rapid scientific development, technological innovation, uh, more economic productivity and so on, they were ended, they were cut short because the religious, the political and commercial establishment, they felt threatened by it and cut it short. Uh, so are we in such a period right now? Because uh, there are forces like that on the march. Well, absolutely. And they, they, they seem to be winning, at least for now. But hopefully this book and others will, will reverse the trends. Before we go on, let me remind everybody, if you like the show, please like it. It's uh, The like button is easy on YouTube. Just press it. Uh, and um, if you want to ask questions um, uh, of Johan, uh, please feel, to, feel free to do that on the Super Chat on YouTube. And, uh, you know, since we're a capitalist enterprise here, the more dollars you put with your question, the more likely I am to ask your question to your one. So the more, the more likely you are to get an answer. So uh, uh, if you support the show, if you want to see the show continue, please use that as one of the ways in which you can support the show. Uh, uh, thank you, guys, for, for uh, everything, uh, all of you who support the show in a variety of different ways. Okay, so... So what is it? What is it that makes it possible for civilizations to progress? Or, or what is it that characterizes civilization? I'd say it's, if we're looking at the institutions that it takes, uh, it's basically three freedoms. It's the freedom to explore strange new knowledge, even though it might threaten ancient taboos, religious uh, understandings and traditions. Uh, then using that science, though that knowledge to create useful technologies to improve people's lives in, in various spheres, to improve the, the power at our disposal, the ability to turn um, useless resources into something that we sustains our lives. Um, and to experiment with the kind of business models that will make this very efficient. So those are the two first freedoms, to, ex to explore and to experiment. But the third one is almost equally important, the freedom to exchange 
this knowledge and the result of it, the technology, the goods and services with others so that we can make use of the brains and the skills and the hard work of everybody else in other places, in our society, in other cities, in other countries, so that there's then strength in numbers because the more people, the more chances that someone will find this important new knowledge, this new technology. And wherever we've had those three things, at least a little bit, of it somewhere in history. We have what the historians are still amazed by. How did they, how were they able to, in such a short time, to create something amazing when there was just sort of dirt and, and famine before? So, so you would describe this as the freedom to think, the freedom to produce and the freedom to trade are the three freedoms that are necessary in order, to, um, in order for civilization to arise. And do we see that in, in, let's say, ancient civilizations or whatever level they could achieve? Yeah, we do. And that's, the, that's why Open is partly a history book. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to explain that it happens early on. The fact why everything important for the average person's opportunities happened only in the last 200 years. That's only because this is the first time we had those institutions in a more sustainable long-term way wasn't cut short. But even in the first eras, when we had the, the first settled civilizations, ancient Mesopotamia, uh, when we had the first Greek city-states and so on, that was only because they were relatively open to those freedoms compared to the other cultures at that time. And even if we go so far back as the, the really the dawn of, of the Homo sapiens 300,000 years ago, we can find in the first human settlements 300,000 years ago in Kenya, uh, we can see that they have tools that are made from obsidian, volcanic glass that couldn't have been produced there because there were no volcanoes. So they had long distance trade relationships with others. So there's something about the intelligence, the ability to communicate and to cooperate that is there from the beginning. And whenever there's been freedom to, to use that in, in, in a wider, in a more important way, then we've seen these results. So, so in, in, in 300,000 years ago, somebody must have, somebody had to have the audacity to discover how to use, to invent new tools. And then people had to, you know, there had to be enough freedom for people to value that and be willing to trade with them. And we see the evidence of that trade in Africa. I mean, it's truly stunning 300,000 years ago. I mean, cause it's not, we're not even fully human, right? It's not homo sapiens. Yeah. 300,000 years right. ago, and yet these principles still uh, still apply then. What is it, because we, we don't know 300,000 years ago, but but we know something about Mesopotamia and Greek cities, and certainly we know about, even in China, I mean, this is true, right? China goes through these periods of great innovation and collapse, and innovation and collapse. What is it that typically triggers that, that collapse? Yeah, China is an interesting example. Of course, they've been everywhere, right? They've been the best and the worst in, in so many different instances. And in uh, Song, China, 1,000 years ago, when uh, Europe in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages was so desperately poor that it wasn't even uh, interesting to raid and to steal because there was nothing there, basically. Uh, well, back then, Song China used uh, the compass to navigate. They used the printing press to print books, and they used gunpowder to fight. The three inventions that Karl Marx, writing in the 1860s, said, this is what created modern capitalist bourgeoisie in Europe. <laughs> so it tells you something that um, progress is possible in other places, in other cultures, but very early on when we have this openness. Well, why was it stopped? Well, there is something called Cardwell's law in economic history, named after uh, Joe, Joe Cardwell, uh, who was a technology writer. And he said that there is always pushback from traditional elites. This is the political elites, the religious elites, and the incumbents in the economy. They dominate, they're in charge. They don't like innovation. And the moment that innovation starts to threaten 
their power. They want to shut it down. And, uh, and this happened in so many places. In every ancient culture, we see this struggle between these forces, the, the new innovators, the eccentrics and the entrepreneurs, and the traditional establishment. And oftentimes, unfortunately, this establishment wins out in the end, often when it threatens religion. For example, in the uh, you know, in the Abbasid Caliphate and then the Muslim civilization 1,000 years ago made amazing progress. Uh, they discovered the Greek philosophy. They discovered Aristotle. They made immense progress in medicine, astronomy, and so on. But the moment, and, and they had some freedom to do that, but the moment that they started to use logic and uh, induction and empirical data to begin to challenge the religious elite, that's what this is too much sure. and they started to shut it down yeah i mean, no religious elites clearly have an incentive to stop uh the free thinking uh, as do many political elites and of course the the freedom to produce and to trade the incumbents have a huge incentive uh to 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 kill and to de to destroy that so <clears throat> every culture that has experienced these um, does does phenomenally well, and you break it down to, uh, in terms of practical policies, you break it down to exchange, you break it down to immigration, and then of course open minds, you know, the ability to 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 think, and and of course, there is no more controversial a topic to controversial topics today than trade, which I find of all the topics out there that are controversial, this one blows my mind. This is the one that I thought Adam Smith solved 250 years ago and we were done with it, but I guess we have to keep revisiting it. Um, and then of course, immigration is probably the most emotionally charged uh, of all the topics out there. Uh, and again, people think of this as, a, as just as a right wing thing, but it's really, at least in the US, both left and right, generally are anti-immigration for different reasons, but... but um, what we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>